I wanted to let you all know that we like to record these programs so that we can share them with an even wider audience. So you will be able to find a recording of this afterwards on Camden Public Library Programs channel on YouTube. So if any of you can't locate that, just reach out to me with an email and I'm happy to send you the link to this program so you can share it with your friends and family. All right, so without further ado, uh, in addition to her work as an artist, Anne consults on environmental and cultural topics. She also teaches jewelry making and traditional corn husk doll making workshops. Um, she studied international affairs at the University of Maine at Orono, and this past February, she was a volunteer with the Camden Conference. Um, I met Anne when she walked into the Camden Public Library, and I found her in the gallery, and we got to talking, and I found out she was an artist, and she started telling me about what some of her inspiration was. And I immediately said, can you please, please, please do a talk for us um, as part of our Bicentennial series. Uh, the Bicentennial series that the library is doing is a series of talks where we are trying to represent um, the, the history of Maine and tell stories from so many perspectives. And I knew that Anne had a really special perspective to represent. So she agreed. And this was a million months ago, it seems. But now we're finally here. So I'm very excited for that. Um, just to let you all know how this is going to go, we're going to, I'm going to turn the program over to Anne in just a minute, um, but we are going to be taking comments and questions during the program via the chat box. So if this is your first time using Zoom, what you can do is take your mouse and hover it down at the bottom of your screen and click the little chat icon, and that should bring up a little white box that says chat. You can type stuff in there the whole time, and at the end of the program, I'll get those questions to Anne. Um, also, Let's see, it'll be a nicer for your, for your viewing experience if you go and uh, select the, the speaker view versus, um, or the, the speaker view versus the gallery view so you don't have to see a lot of talking heads when we're doing this, but um, it'll just make one big head on your screen. <laughs> All right, so without further ado, I turn it over to Anne pollard Ranko. Thank you for joining us, Anne. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here virtually. Um, it's a little bit different than we had planned, but I'm so happy that we can all come together and that an audience from all around the country, you know, can join us. That's so exciting. I'm going to go ahead and just get my keynote presentation up on the screen here. So hopefully you will all be able to see that. How does that look, Julia? Can you see that on your end? It looks good. Yes, I see your first slide. Wonderful. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So my name is Anne pollard Ranko, and I am a member of the Penobscot Nation. And I wanted to give you all a little bit of an overview of what traditional Penobscot territory would have looked like prior to colonization. So this map that you see on your screen shows roughly what Penobscot territory would have looked like. The important thing to keep in mind is that borders um, in Penobscot and Wabanaki culture were more fluid, so there was a lot of movement back and forth, and they weren't strict boundaries like um, you know you'd see today if you were trying to go to Canada, for instance. So this is what the traditional Penobscot territory would have looked like, and I wanted to share a little bit about our reservation, which is a much smaller um, parcel of land. It's actually an island in the middle of the Penobscot River. So I have prepared a few slides just to give you an idea of the context and, and where we are located. So this little um, pin on the map is going to get bigger and show you a greater image of what the land looks like. You can start to see that we have zoomed in and now we are at the Penobscot Reservation. And this is a very small island just north of Old Town, Maine. So I don't know if some of you are familiar with this area, but it's uh, the home of the University of Maine, just slightly south on Marsh Island. And that's probably the most notable feature at this, at this time in history. But for thousands and thousands of years, going back beyond 13,000 years, this place was uh, incredibly important and continues to be incredibly important to the Penobscot people. So this is just a little bit of an overview of the reservation today, but I wanted to share with you a little bit of a story um, that is really personal and dear to my heart. Uh, I grew up here on Marsh Island, like I mentioned, just a little bit south of Indian Island um, in Orono. I'm actually the great, 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 great granddaughter of Chief Orono, 
for whom the town is named. And I have been reflecting on that since I was little, just the importance that connection and continuity of living in a place and having ancestors who have lived in this place for 13,000 plus years. It's a feeling that is so indescribable, yet extremely important. And one of my favorite things to do living here and growing up is to go and walk along the river. And there's some beautiful, beautiful sights to be seen. In particular, one special spot for me is a place where I like to go and watch the sunset. And it's just a really, really remarkable place to see the reflection of the colors in the water. It's just so beautiful. And I had been going there for many, many years. And when the water level receded after the Penobscot uh, River Restorations Project um, succeeded in removing the dam in BZ, which we'll talk about a little bit later on, the water level went down and exposed this beautiful petroglyph on a rock that I went and sat at every evening for most of my life. And it's a little bit harder to see without being there in person, but I'll get to the next slide where it shows a little bit greater detail. Perhaps you can see the round circle and a petroglyph is a series of peckings in the rock that will depict an image. So it could be anywhere from an eagle, um, fish, other culturally important symbols, and you can find them um, along the Kennebec River in Maine, as well as this one that I found in Orono, and then up in Matthias Bay, down east Maine um, in Passamaquoddy territory. There are new excuse me, numerous petroglyphs um, to be found. So this was a really exciting and important moment that this place that I had been visiting my whole life, one of my ancestors also visited and sat there thousands of years ago or hundreds of years ago and, and appreciated the beautiful sky and sunset and evening. And to me, that just was beyond words, uh, the feeling that that evoked. So. Um, this is a picture of my grandmother. Uh, her name was Beatrice, and I never got to meet her, but she is a person who I feel such a strong connection to. Um, we look quite a bit alike, and um, just hearing stories about her, I see a lot of similarities between us. And I know that she loved the river. She lived on Indian Island, and um, her house was right along the river, and it's just such an important part of her life, as well as, you know, countless, countless generations. So I am a writer as well, and I usually will bring my notebook with me and just write whatever I'm inspired to when I'm sitting along the river. So this was just something I wanted to share with you all. This river flows through my blood. There is an indescribable connection to this place where my ancestors lived for thousands of years. A sense of familiarity, belonging, knowing, and love. I'm so thankful for this river and this inextricable relationship. I wanted to share a little bit about Katahdin, which is our sacred mountain, located about 100 miles north of Old Town or the Indian Island Reservation. Uh, the spiritual significance of Katahdin can't be uh, explained without having experienced this incredible, incredible place. And for those of you who have had the privilege of visiting Baxter State Park and, and seeing Katahdin, you can probably understand where I'm coming from, but this image, um, just as a very small fraction of, of its magnificent magnificence. But I wanted to talk about the Katahdin 100, which is a spiritual journey that was started by Barry Dana, a former chief of the Penobscot Nation, where community members travel upriver via canoeing. Um, some people will actually go uh, biking, walking, and running. Uh, 100 miles to Katahdin, and this happens every September. And it's been a tradition that I have been partaking in, um, supporting my father who paddles it uh, since I was a baby. I've been there and it's just the most remarkable link to our sacred mountain. So this is north of where I live. And then if you travel downriver, you would come to West Penobscot Bay. And those of you who live in the Belfast, Camden, Rockport area uh, will understand how incredibly special and beautiful this place is. I had the privilege of living here prior to COVID. I lived in Rockport and just, it was uh, a dream come true. It's just the most beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place. And I hope those of you who haven't had the opportunity to visit Rockport will be able to in Camden and just the mid coast area in general. Is, is really strikingly beautiful. So these are a few images of the beauty that, that one, can, one can observe. 
So the, the focus of this talk is going to be around the Penobscot River Restoration Project and its significance to land conservation and just the environmental movement within Maine and across the world and how it has inspired my art and how I can go forth with this message that we need to protect this sacred river because it is so important and that it's such broader um, it extrapolates to such a broader level where other other people who have you know similar environmental concerns can come together and work towards protecting the environment in their home hometowns and, and countries so the penobscot river restoration project was a project a multi a collaboration between the penobscot tribe and many other entities to remove two of the dams south of the penobscot nation and this was initiated and completed in 2013 and this picture that you can see on your screen right now is actually of the vz dam and was removed in 2013, restoring the traditional flow of the Penobscot River, which had been blocked for over 100 years. And the significance of this is that over 13 species of anadromous fish, most notably the Atlantic salmon, can now return to their spawning grounds, which would have been blocked for over a century. And the restoration of this habitat is profound. The medicinal plants that had once been unable to grow because the river was too, too, the level was too high are now restored and the abundance of life is just incredible. But there's a lot of work to do still. The level of water all receding exposed a lot of trash and glass and broken pottery that people had discarded. And this was inspiration for uh, collecting this and turning it into wearable jewelry. So the photographs in front of you right now are depicting some of the trash. There are heaps and heaps and heaps of glass and pottery just all strewn about on the banks of the river. And it's really, really hurts my heart because my ancestors took care of this river for so, so, so many years. And upon colonization, in such a short window of this river's history, we can see that it was disrespected, not only with litter, but chemicals and waste being dumped into the river. And it's a wound to the river. And to me, as an artist, I wanted to come up with a way to help to not only spread the message about the importance of taking care of our river, but also how can I create something that people would you know, be interested in and spark interest. So I collected these pieces of glass and pottery and have been doing so for many years and turned them into pendants, earrings, rings, sculptures, and this, each piece has the ability to deliver a message about environmentalism because you know somebody might say oh that's such a beautiful piece of jewelry but there's a whole story behind it and it's just you know so so many years in the making and so so many people went into went into this whole process and this being possible and it's important to share this with others so that they can take that message these pieces have been gifted all around the world and it excites me so much when i receive a message that somebody you know was able to have a really meaningful discussion because uh, their piece of jewelry just sparked this conversation or the sculptures that they gift these are uh, madoan women and they're made using vintage buttons that i source from the thrift stores or just flea markets that we used to be able to go to before before you know, unfortunate events occurred in our in our country and around the world but I have quite a collection that I can put into making these sculptures I use little pieces of pottery shards as the skirts and then wire wrapped um, with a little bit of glue here and there just to keep it in place and they're a really cheerful and just fun way of, of having this discussion about environmentalism and moving on, another series that I have um, done in the past year is collecting pieces of driftwood that had been part of abutments that corralled logs when the logging industry flourished back in the 1800s. All of the logs would come down river and there would be various points along the river where they would be corralled and um, processed and moved about. So the dam was, a way that they would be blocked from flowing down river after, excuse me, after the logging industry, you know, was suppressed. And I collected these pieces of driftwood and turned them into 
different um, culturally significant designs as well as incorporating medicinal plants and animals that would have been you know present and still are present now that the the dam has been removed and they've been allowed to grow and these are literal talking sticks people can you know bring them and teach their children children about the importance of environmental um, care and just taking care of this homeland and how, how that can be translated into art. And just a few examples are in front of you, but I've made over 100 pieces like this and, and I'm so happy that they've all found homes. My newest series and what I'm most passionate about right now are watercolor and double curve motif designs that incorporate the animals that call Wabanaki homeland, home. I would like to talk a little bit about, to those of you who aren't familiar with the double curve design, its, significant, its significance is that it um, emblemizes a system of balance. So the double curve is balance and it talks about the sustainability and connection to the environment and how it's all balanced, equilibrium and intertwined with the animals and plants who live here. So I'll just show you a few images of my work. Great blue heron, osprey, red-tailed hawk. And so that's a little bit about what I do as an artist. Um, I'll leave my contact information up here and you can find me on Instagram or email me if you have any other questions about the work. But that is just a little bit of an overview. And whenever I give a presentation, I like to leave a lot of room for you know, discussion and questions and whatnot. So I'd really like to turn the floor over to you and, and we can you know, have a great dialogue. So thank you so much. Thanks, Anne. So now would be a really great time. Um, if anyone has a question, please go ahead and type it into the chat box and um, I can make sure that Anne gets, gets that question and answers it for you. So Anne, while we're waiting um, to see if any questions pop up, um, I would like to hear about besides so who is, who is an influence to you right now? What, what other artists do, have you been, been looking at who, who are exciting you? Oh my gosh, well, I love to be connected with artists within my tribe. A lot of extremely talented bead workers um, that you know, I'd be happy to share their, I love to support fellow Native artists and, and their contact as well, if anybody is interested. Um, my inspiration really just comes from nature and the environment and my passion for this homeland and just wanting to share that with the world. Okay, we just had a question pop in. Um, Rachel asks, what are the most pressing environmental challenges facing your tribe and other indigenous people in Maine today? That's a great question. I can't speak for all tribal members, but I think for me, it's just sometimes growing up, I felt really invisible. And a lot of people don't even know that there's an Indian reservation in this Penobscot County and just don't really understand the significance of this homeland and that people are still here and we are still living and practicing and wanting to share our culture. But there's an element of invisibility. So I can only really speak for myself in terms of the, that barrier, that there really hasn't been a dialogue up until very recently. Um, and just that willingness that people are exhibiting in, in more modern times is, is really inspiring. So I guess the challenge would be just, we're here, you know, we're still here. Um, okay. another, another question has come in from um, Monica. She's asking, when and how can we get involved in river cleanup? Oh, that's a great question as well. I don't have that um, information because I am not involved specifically with the Penobscot River Restoration. It's just something that has really inspired my art and been a vehicle towards these discussions. But I would be really happy to either provide Julia with some links to um, help get involved. I don't know of any ongoing cleanup I would recommend go for a walk, pick up some glass and, you know, and dispose of it in a, you know, proper and sustainable way. Thank you. That's an excellent answer. Um, and yes, again, reach out to me. Uh, my email is jpierce, J-P-I-E-R-C-E at librarycamden.org. And I'm happy to, um, for, you know, further any of your questions to Anne after this program. Um, all right, let me get back to these other questions. It says, yes, I would love to learn more about Native artists to follow. So yeah. how can we find research on, or how can we find resources for um, Native artists to follow? 
Well, I am connected with a lot of people just who I know from, um, I send my work, I saw my work, excuse me, at the Maine Indian Basket Makers Festival, which would have occurred in early July. So I would really encourage you to keep your eyes out for um, once, you know, COVID, you know, hopefully within the next year or so we'll be under control. We can, you know, sell our work again and, and share with others. So the Maine Indian Basket Makers Festival is held at the Abbey Museum in Bar Harbor. And in December, there is a um, art, show at the Hudson Museum and I don't know exactly the date but it's it's like early December so you'd have to keep your eyes out on the, the main Indian basket makers website for that information but in terms of finding artists to follow right now I would suggest um, Instagram you can look on hashtags for Wabanaki artists and you know just other indigenous artists excellent recommendation um, all right the next question is have you shown your art other have you shown your art other Wabanaki people and artists? It's very well done. So it sounds like well, a nice compliment. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, my first exhibition um, was when I was 13. I took part in the Equinox Petroglyph Project, which was a collaboration of many artists. And I was privileged to be a part of that. And my work was exhibited at the Augusta State House, the University of Maine of Chias, and several other um, venues. Um, in more recent times, my work is sold at the Abbey Museum, and I attend the Belfast Farmers Market and a lot of different craft and art shows throughout the state during the summer months. And the Common Ground Fair, which is another excellent venue and a wonderful, wonderful place to see demonstrations of traditional um, ash splint making. Yeah, it's, I know it's very difficult. The, the library has a couple art festivals that, mm -hmm. that are not going to be happening, or the summer art festival is not going to be happening, and it is, it, it leaves a hole in your heart for sure. Mm -hmm. you know? It really does, because I'd love to say like, oh, next week you can find me here, or find this artist there, but unfortunately, you know, that's just not possible right now. Um, someone is asking, is the museum or other sites on Indian Island currently open? Uh, at this moment, the island is closed off to non-community members to, you know, make sure that we're safe and stay safe. I am not sure when the museum will be reopening, but it is an outstanding museum and really, really well curated. Uh, Jennifer Neptune, um, one of my cousins, is just an outstanding curator and she's a phenomenal artist as well. So I, I would search for her name. She's a basket maker and a really wonderful person. Super. Um, Sarah is asking, can you pass along any names of native artists in Southwest New Hampshire? Do you happen to, are you Ooh, with anyone? Down I there? am not connected to any artists in Southwest New Hampshire, I'm sorry, but um, like I said, you know, Instagram, if you are following, you know, other native artists, you know, just reach out and, and just build a really great network of these really talented people who you can support because now more than ever, it's so important to support indigenous artists. Um, we have, have another question from Emily. It says, how did you get started on your artistic journey before the river restoration project that led you to the pieces that you showed tonight? Sure, um, that's a great question. So um, when I was 13, I had a horse and, and horses are a bit expensive. And my parents um, really encouraged me to, you know, that responsibility of, you know, providing for my horse. And I decided to start my own business with the intent of, you know, being able to um, pay for it and buy treats and saddles and saddle pads and whatnot. So I had a massive collection of sea glass and pottery that I'd been collecting since I was around two. Was, uh, you know, when can little kids pick up sea glass off the beach? So I'd say, you know, two, three years old. And I bought some wire and started wrapping it and then was able to sell my work both at the Abbey Museum and the um, Indian Market places that are held throughout you know the year and so that's how I got my foot in the door with art um, so it's been a really great experience in terms of just meeting people and you know it's over 13 years now of just being able to share my work and how it's evolved um, with my different passions and especially with the Penobscot River being right out my back door and just that relationship with, with this place. Mm. We're getting a lot of great questions coming in. Um, Star asks, what inspires your sculptural pieces? Hey, Star. Um, <laughs> I, I think if it's a star that I know, uh, hello. <laughs> um, the sculptural pieces, um, I have two different series of the sculptures. One is called the Medoan Woman series, and which translates to medicine woman in Algonquin language. And I like to depict these um, different culturally significant um, 
plants and like ash splints and sweet grass and baskets and I want to be able to share that in you know this this miniature format that can also incorporate the pottery and, and the glass pieces and and just be like a really really unique piece of art that people can can just look at and be joyful so I guess the wanting to share joy and you know the culture yeah, I just from the, even the small picture, the gestures that seem to be captured in those sculptures, they were really very joyful. So oh, lovely. I, I look forward to seeing more of them. Oh, thank um, you. Someone has actually asked, will there be an online version of the Indian Basket Makers Festival? Have you heard anything about that? I haven't heard anything about that, but I would love that. That would be really great. Um, perhaps I maybe get... someone in the audience who yeah, if, if it's the star it. who I think it is, maybe she could. Yeah. If it's not, I'm sorry if you're not the star who I think you are. <laughs> I, I think it is based on the first I got. Um, yes, so Star or anyone else who is involved with that, if you have any uh, insight about that or, or can um, help us answer that question, please feel free to type it into the chat box and, and the rest of the audience is welcome to read that as well and, and I'll, I'll read it aloud if I come to it. Um, so let's see the next one. Tell us more about your talking sticks and the various designs that you have used on them. Sure, yeah, absolutely. I could get a, I'm just going to get back into the slideshow so that I can kind of, sure. oh, something's going on with my keypad. Maybe I won't get back into it. I, wish, I think it may have just gone to sleep. Yeah, <laughs> I was talking too much. <laughs> um, back in here and okay, this full screen for you. So the talking sticks, um, the, official title that I came up with, but it's it's just the name of the series is Penobscot um, Home Blessings. These these sticks or pieces of driftwood um, can, you know, adorn a mantelpiece or a counter or just be a little nook of the house and just kind of radiate this like hundreds of years of being in the river and just all the accumulation of you just imagine like all the storms and everything that that they've gone through and then to be washed ashore and dried out and then collected. Um, I like to do the double curb design. So after I talked a little bit about my watercolors, double curb, you can probably start to see some of the double curves in, in elements incorporated as well as I love um, flowers. So some of like wild mustard is on one of these, um, roses, um, violets, and some other medicinal plants um, and then animals. Super, thank you. Yeah, yeah those are, are all of them as large as the one that's being held in the in the picture? No, that was a really um, large piece that um, it's kind of hard to see without being able to look at it in person, but it was shaped like a seal and the eye was actually exactly where the eye of the seal would have been. So it was just really inspired and wanted to be a seal. And I have a really strong connection. You probably noticed another um, piece of mine incorporated the seal. Seals are really significant to me. I had a wonderful experience um, with a seal following me around on the beach when I was a toddler. A little baby seal followed me around for hours on the beach. Um, while its mother was out fishing and then she came back and, and, and collected her baby but that was just like a really formative experience for me and I found out recently that Chief Orono as I mentioned who's my great times eight grandfather um, his signature was a seal so it's really important to to me. Yeah I, I think that it's really easy for people to connect to your work and to feel so good about it when they're when they're you know looking at it. I, I have really enjoyed I really have, you know, as I've been promoting this, um, the image of the red-tailed hawk that you submitted oh. to me, um, it's so strange that I've been looking at it a lot because again, I've been talking about your program mm -hmm. coming up and all of a sudden in my backyard, I've had oh. a red-tailed hawk appear. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so it's, it's been very special and, and I've been very moved by it. Um, and so yeah, that piece, I, I love it. Thank you. It's just great. And, and oh. now I feel like I have a special friend out there. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Julia. I love that. <laughs> All right, back to you. <laughs> Enough about me. Um, okay, so Alex says, it's, a, it's amazing that you are able to use your work to share your culture. It's so important, and thank you for sharing that we're still here. Do you have any advice on how to use your work to start conversations with Native communities, too? Um, it's amazing that work like yours opens up the conversation both inside and outside of communities. Also, hello from the Catawba Nation. Wow, hi. I never said that wrong. <laughs> Thank you so much for your thoughtful words and your question. I love to be involved with my community and other artists and just talking about and sharing our work. 
is just so important because it really builds, I think it boosts confidence for everybody and just that what we're doing is so important. We're carrying on traditions that our you know, parents and our grandparents and going back generations and generations have, have carried on. And just, it's almost, it's such an honor to be an artist and, and to have support not only from the community, but non-community members and allies and just being able to come together and then share. It's, it's, it's remarkable. And having well, a platform and voice for it as well. Yes, and, and you were very eloquent too, which helps. <laughs> Um, Star has actually responded. She said, yes, there will be a Digital Indian Basket Makers Festival on July 11th. It hasn't been announced yet, but the Abbey Museum and Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance are working on it. So everyone keep your eyes out for some updates on that. Um, that's very exciting. Yay. Good. All right. Next question. I'm very interested in Wabanaki in in Wabanaki artist, I am an artist and I would really like to change my focus to get more focused on nature. I feel deeply saddened by how careless the tribes have been treated throughout the history of our country. Um, we have another question or another comment that says, Twitter is surprisingly great for finding <laughs> native artists too. So there, that's a- I'm not a, I'm not a Twitter user, but maybe I'll, I'll need to convert to Twitter. <laughs> that's great, thanks for that thought. Um, we have another comment says, love your work and keep going. And um, someone asked July 11th, question mark. And someone says that was right. Um, and from Sally, it says, can we talk a little bit more about how your experiences in your youth and your heritage have influenced your approach to the natural world today? Sure. Yeah, I'd be really happy to share about that. So in nature and my relationship with nature is inextricably I, it's hard to describe it's when I'm in nature I'm at home and it's just such a, a feeling of belonging and I can describe that you know being on Marsh Island and growing up here where my ancestors lived but also traveling throughout the state and having the opportunity to go to the coast growing up and um, if you look at the map that I showed you, the river opens up into Penobscot Bay and having a connection with places along the river and that I look forward to taking my children to someday. And that happens when I have children, not yet, but um, I, you know, it's just continuing that, that tradition. So I'd say ancestors, connection to ancestors, but also thinking about the future generations and, and wanting to share that and protect it so that we can share it with future generations. So it sounds like within your community um, and within your family, uh, you were instilled at a very young age with this particular appreciation. And do you oh, see that as a value that is still consistently um, important to uh, the Penobscot people and and the the passion to pass that down? Is that is that oh, it's unwavering? Absolutely unwavering. Oh, we have another comment here. It's from Alex. It says. Um, the Catawba, and again, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, nation is in South Carolina. We're also the river, the people of the river. So your work oh. and this conversation is deeply personal to us too. Um, thanks also to the Camden Public Library for putting this together. You're welcome, Alex. Thank <laughs> you. And please share this afterward. <laughs> like so. I'd love to hear um, in future maybe other discussions if there are similar concerns about, you know, river restoration and just preservation and environmentalism, you know, what those concerns are and challenges that you're facing or have faced. Yeah, speaking of that, um, I, when I first met you, I had mentioned that it's been a big conversation in the Camden area because of the um, McGuntacook restoration project that's being proposed. Um, so that was a very, a very timely uh, discussion we had. Um, about the the possibility of that happening, what would the effects be, and how would people perceive those kinds of changes? So I know that the um, the town has sort of put on hold that project, as many other projects, uh, because of COVID nineteen. Um, mm. But you know, if you, if it's something that that the audience is interested in, please keep your ears out. I imagine that that they'll be announcing um, some more programs about the river mm. restoration at some point in the near future. Um, is there anybody else who has any questions? Um, oh, another one just popped up. What other changes have you personally witnessed in the Penobscot since the dams were removed? Well, to be able to restore the link to our river and just being able to see that flow 
as you know traditionally had for over 13,000 years prior to this you know colonization of the river so there are, there are small things like the decolonization of the river the dam removal and cleanup subsequent cleanups um, the impact on the tribe would be the ability to you know fish for some of the fish that would have you know traditionally come up here but you know unfortunately due to heavy pollution in the water they're generally unsafe to eat but being able you know in some places to subsist off of the fish is really important so that was a major a major concern for the the penobscot nation what are some other major concerns that are on your radar today that you think that maybe um, maybe other Mainers might not be as familiar with, especially people who don't live in the area. I wouldn't say, I mean, there are a lot of concerns, um, but nothing that I think would be like a like very, very, very major concern. I think they're just talking points and ways that we can come together. That's how I like to look at, at, at these things. I wouldn't necessarily call them concerns. Uh, and one thing that is really important and dear to me is land conservation. And a lot of the land trusts in Maine, um, the acreage owned by land trusts is uh, astronomical. And that was all, you know, like Penobscot territory and, you know, Abenaki territory and Passamaquoddy territory. And there is a huge movement in the state right now to welcome back Native people onto that land. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something really important because there are so many ways that we can sustainably harvest um, medicinal um, medicines and plants and um, birch bark. So there are lots of conversations that can be had, but they're not, they're not concerns. They're just conversations that are just waiting to, waiting to happen and are happening. Mm -hmm. Um, professionally speaking, I, as I was reading your bio, um, it talks about some workshops uh, and traditional crafts uh, that you teach. Can you tell us a little bit more about, again, I know COVID makes it a little bit difficult no, to do these things, um, but can you tell us a little bit more about what some of those projects are and how, if people are interested, um, how they can communicate with you about those? Absolutely, yeah. So I've been really fortunate to have great support from the Abbey Museum in Bar Harbor. Um, I've been invited on numerous occasions to teach sea glass workshops to children and adults alike because everybody's everybody loves to, to get their hands with the you know sea glass and make jewelry. It's just such a fun activity. Um, I've done corn husk doll making workshops at the Indigenous Peoples Day in Portland at the um, Historical Society there. Um, also, I'm just trying to think, I've done so many that and it's kind of hard to, those are the ones that are coming to mind, the ones that I've done most recently. Um, Main Humanities Day at the um, Bangor Children's Museum, I taught corn husk doll making. So any event that, you know, would bring together people and have common interest in Indigenous crafts or just environmental sustainability from an Indigenous perspective, the message can be tailored to children and adults alike. And I think that's the beauty of it. Everybody can appreciate nature and, and want, can want to protect it. Yes, and the perspective um, that is portrayed, I think, during the transition of, of taking those items from, from waste, like you did with your, and turning it into something um, something beautiful and something that can be used to uh, be a launching point for for the storytelling and for you know, the conversation. That's that's very very special and very unique. Um, we have a comment from Ken, um, and it says, "I am from the Tobique Maliseet in New Brunswick. Our traditional name is oh, I'm not going to do well with this. I apologize. I mispronounce everything. Um, Wallastokiek, people of the beautiful river. We are working in restoration projects." Oh, that's outstanding. Um, I'm actually um, also Maliseet myself. My grandmother and great grandmother are from the Maliseet line. So perhaps we have some relations. That would be really, really cool. <laughs> um, Sally is asking, tell us more about the medicinal plants that you're collecting along the Penobscot. Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the only, and my favorite, so this is one that it's really easy to identify once you're able to see photographs. Um, mint, there's the only indigenous mint to North America is a river mint and it grows um, in sort of like a little bit of a muddy uh, soil and also in rocky areas. And it's just the most beautiful, beautiful smell and you can collect it and you can make teas out of it. Of course, consult um, experts on that and identification because I wouldn't want to lead you astray, but um, the, the scent is a pretty dead giveaway. So that's one of my favorite things to collect. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you very much. But without having proper identification, I wouldn't want to. No, no, I understand. Yeah, that's a pretty safe one. <laughs> 
I was thinking to myself, I was like, this is a whole other topic we could talk about for like an hour. It's so wonderful and fascinating. We have There's so many people who are more knowledgeable than me, so I wouldn't <laughs> even want to take the spotlight on that. <laughs> well, I'll have to reach out and see, see if we can find some people. That's a, it's a really... I have recommendations for you. If you Good. Know. Okay. We'll talk later. Okay. Um, Okay, this is a last chance if anyone wants to pop a comment or a, um, a question for Anne into the chat box. That would be fantastic. Um, These have been excellent questions and comments. I, I'm so appreciative of everybody's support. We have someone who, Rachel is saying deep gratitude. Oh, thank you, Rachel. Um, Anne, do you want to take a moment to put, to put your uh, contact information back up? Yeah, on absolutely, that made me go into screen share again. And just let people know how they can follow you or find out more information about you Absolutely. in case they want to reach out um, personally and have some questions. And again, I encourage you all, I'm going to be posting this on the Camden Public Library Programs YouTube page. So um, hopefully I'll have it up by tomorrow morning and you can take that link and share it with your friends. This has been really very, very interesting and a wonderful presentation. Um, here's Anne's contact information right here. It's annepollardranko at gmail.com and find her on Instagram. I follow Anne on Instagram. She posts beautiful, beautiful work um, at annepollardranko. And perhaps I'll be a Twitter user in, in the near future. <laughs> well, I, I hope. I'm excited for the online basket market, so that should be interesting. I'm going to keep my eyes peeled for more information about that. Um, so I think I'm speaking, oh, oh, we're getting somebody else coming in oh. with a comment. Uh, echoing Ken in, in, uh, Kataba, we are, ye is where, is where, so cool to see parallel conversations. Hoa, thank you. Um, our oh. EPA, our EPA department also works in preservation and alongside conservation projects too. Hoa, thank you. Uh, oops, said that twice. Ha ha. Well. <laughs> That's okay. You can't say you can't say thank you and nice, oh. nice <laughs> enough, right? <laughs> in Penobscot language, the word for thank you is "woliwani." So you could say "kuti uh, woliwani," which is "thank you very much." So "kuti woliwani." <laughs> well, thank you so much, Anne, for joining us tonight. I really thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. <laughs> and I really evening. a lot. Um, so again, if anyone has questions, please reach out to me. Um, for those of you joining us for the first time this evening, please look at other uh, programs that the library is offering at librarycamden.org. And we are happy to send you a link to join us for future programs. So thank you, Anne. Have a great rest of your night. And good night, Anne. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Here, bye.